st uh, started, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to know you. So grateful that you came to us. When at some point in our life, all we wanted to do was run away from you. That you captured our hearts and our attention. That you changed us, made us into your image. Lord, that you made us new creations in Christ Jesus. We're grateful. I thank you for the fellowship of believers. I thank you for the love, Lord, that you give to us and the love that we can give to one another. I pray that you might help us, Lord, as we study your word today, that we might have insight and information, that we might have inspiration, and that we might add perspiration to that. that we might get out and actually change because of it. So, Lord, speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're, we're back in the book of Hebrews, and uh, I, I would love to say it's new and improved, <laughs> because it is. It's funny, because if people say it's new and improved, it's one or the other. It can't be new and improved. It's either new or it's improved. It can't be new and improved, right? I don't know. I analyze things like that. I spend countless hours thinking. But essentially, the book of Hebrews is speaking to the Hebrews about why, once you've come to Jesus Christ, you can never go back. And we looked at that in chapter 6, that there's no way that you can go back because it's like unseeing something. You can't unsee something, right? And there's a, there's a sense in which when Christ changes your heart and that information and that inspiration comes, you will never be the same and you can never go back. You just can't. I have tried this experientially. It doesn't work. And he's explaining that to the Hebrews. In chapter 7, we're going to look at this character called Melchizedek, where we have basically two passages in the Old Testament where he's mentioned, uh, one all the way back in Genesis and one in Psalm 110. And the, the, the writer of Hebrews is going to explain to us what this little window from the past is going to tell us about Jesus. And so it's a bit of a legal document, if you will, because he's going to talk about how Jesus is better. He's better than the priesthood. He's better than anything that you can imagine. And he's better even than this person, Melchizedek. And we're going to be looking at the prophecy about how the Messiah would come and how he would have a priesthood like Melchizedek. We see Jesus is greater, which is the theme of the entire book, that Jesus is greater than the fathers. That would be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all of the 12 tribes, and from then down, the prophets, the angels, that he's better than man. He's not just a man. He's the God-man. That he's better than Moses, who's brought the law, but Jesus brings grace and truth. We saw he's better than the high priest, than the Sabbath, that Jesus is our rest that we enter into with him. That he's better than Joshua, even though they're the same name. Yeshua, Joshua, and Jesus. They're the same name in different languages. And he's got a better sacrifice, and he is a better temple. So all of these things, Jesus is better than what they've come out of and what they're very tempted to go back to, which is the sacrificial system. Because there is some kind of a comfort in the familiar, right? Which is why you wear shoes until you could see your toes. Because there's comfort in the familiar. That's why you keep that old lazy boy that has a distinctive odor. <laughs> and yet you keep it because it, it, it conforms. And we tend to be very comfortable with the familiar. Unfortunately, that's not a good enough reason to hang on to it, especially if it's outdated. We looked at the warnings throughout the book of Hebrews. We don't have any here in this chapter, but about drifting, doubting, disobedience, about being dull of hearing, departing from the living God, which we saw, and despising when we get to chapter 10, and denying. So you'll see there's a bit of a progression there. And we all run the danger of that because we walk through a dirty world and we get our feet dirty, don't we? And it's very easy to kind of lose faith and lose our perspective. So we're given the warning. So chapter six was never go back. There's absolutely no way you can unsee, unknow, and unchange 
once Jesus Christ has come into your life. Amen? Amen. And I'm glad for that because I don't keep my salvation. Jesus does. The Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing my inheritance. And you as well, if you know him. So, we went over the departing. Now, this week, we're going to be in chapter 7, this character Melchizedek. So, let's jump into verse 1. <clears throat> and we was introduced last week, this week. He's just assuming that we remember he, we were in the previous chapter. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. If you remember when we went through Genesis Abraham had to go rescue Lot. Lot and his family, his wife, his children, and all of his stuff got taken from the city of Sodom by these pirates, essentially. He came and took them away and went with them. And Abraham heard about it, and he assembled over 300 men of his own household and went and rescued him and got not only he and his family back, but also all of the people of Sodom. Now, this is before God poured his judgment out on them, and he brought them all back. In the midst of doing that, after the battle, there's this person that just shows up, and his name is Melchizedek. He's a king and a priest. And if you know anything about the Old Testament and the setup of the Mosaic law, you cannot be king and priest. In fact, uh, one, of the, one of the kings got in a lot of trouble, if you remember Saul, because he stepped into the office of being a priest, and he made a sacrifice to God, and then Samuel shows up and he says, what are you doing? You're not supposed to do that. And because of that, the kingdom's going to be taken from you. Because he overstepped and he overstepped his bounds of authority. So you don't mix the two things. And yet here we have a character called Melchizedek who is king and priest. And this predates actually the Mosaic law. So it's a bit of an enigma that he's bringing up here, and we're going to take a look at it. In Genesis 14, this is the, pa this is the passage that explains him. And then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And, he, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. So Abraham gave a tithe to this guy, Melchizedek, which, is, which means tenth. He basically gave it off the top. He gave a tenth off the top of everything that they gained in this thing. And you say, well, wait a minute. The Mosaic Law didn't even come yet. There was no such thing as tithing yet. That's right. So this is a weird thing. This happened long before Moses shows up and before the law comes. In Psalm 110, this is the second time it's mentioned in the Old Testament by David. And it's a prophecy about the Messiah who would come. A Psalm of David, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. If you remember, we've gone over that before too. It's a prophecy about how the Lord Jesus Christ goes and resurrects, goes to heaven and sits and waits until the right time where he comes back. And uh, down in verse four, it says, the Lord has sworn and he will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now this was David writing after the Mosaic law was set up and the priesthood. And if you were a priest, it's because you were in the tribe of Levi and you were only supposed to be a priest from the Levitical, uh, from the Levitical line. So you had to be related. It's, it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's actually who you're related to. So that's how that worked. And you know, you see one of these things in the scripture and usually you just kind of read through it and you go, yeah, okay, some dude, got it, next. And you just keep going, because, you know, you've got to keep on track. You've got a reading program, by goodness, and, you know, time is ticking. And so you, you, you think about it, and there's a priest and a king. Now, what, what in the world is all that about? Verse 2, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, which we just read, first being translated king of righteousness, that's what his name means, and then also king of Salem, which Jerusalem actually comes from this, meaning king of peace. So it's interesting, this character just shows up and suddenly he's receiving a tithe. He just showed up and blessed Abraham. You know, you know what a blessing is, right? It's not like when someone sneezes. That's different. A blessing is when you have the authority by God to speak into somebody's else, someone else's life, something God desires to do. 
That's what a blessing is. A blessing is where it's not, you know, gee, I hope everything goes well for you. That's a different thing. You know, you christen a boat with a <laughs> bottle of champagne, uh, one of those, that's about as good. But a blessing is when you're, when you're inspired by God to speak something to someone that comes from God. And you have to be in touch with what God wants to do in that person's life. And, you know, we pray in the spirit and we bless people in the spirit. Um, I don't know if you guys get a chance to do that, but uh, what a blessing it is to be able to pray for somebody and pray God's blessing upon them. You really have to know what God wants for their life to do that. So here's Melchizedek. He just shows up. He's a king and a priest, which is weird. And he's speaking a blessing over Abraham and speaking into his life those things that God wishes to do. And Abraham, feeling compelled, as anyone would when somebody does a great thing for you, you feel compelled to do something great for them, right? Oh, come on, people. I know you do. <laughs> you feel compelled. Like somebody... It, it, it's the worst thing on Christmas. Somebody gives you a gift and it's like very expensive and, and precious and wonderful. And you go, well, I didn't get you anything. <laughs> That's a terrible feeling, right? But this is a response. So Abraham, who's, by the way, in the Jewish world, he's, he's the king, okay? He's, he's the guy who's at the top of the food chain. He's the beginning of all the Jews. He was called out and he was uh, obedient to God. And by faith, he went where God told him to go. So he's a superstar. And the Jews are looking at him as that. And he says, well, what about this guy Melchizedek who shows up and Abraham pays him a tithe and he blesses Abraham. Now, you know, the person who's doing the blessing is the person who's really in touch with God and giving a blessing. That person is greater in authority or closer to God. And so all of these things are just very, very interesting. And he's going to make a point of this as he goes on. And it's, I think it's also interesting that he brings out bread and wine. Sound familiar? It sounds a lot like communion. It sounds a lot like the Passover. It sounds a lot like the last supper that Jesus shared with his disciples. So there's a lot of coincidence here. You know, coincidence isn't a kosher word. So there are all sorts of parallels here. And he's, he's really a type of Christ who comes early. Some people believe that he was a theophany, which is a pre-appearing of, of Christ before his birth, uh, a physical appearance. But I don't believe so because the text will tell us uh, it's somebody who's like Melchizedek. He's without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the spoils. First of all, something to notice, it says he's without mother and with, without father and without mother and without genealogy. That doesn't mean that he didn't have one. It just means that there's no proof of it. If you were going to be a priest, you had to have proof of your ancestry. If you didn't have that, well, then you were disqualified. So there's no proof of his genealogy. He's got no birth certificate because nobody knows where he came from. He's got no headstone. So we don't know where he was planted or that he even died. And all of those things, the omission of them are intentional so that we might see Jesus when he comes and go, oh, wow, this is like very close to who Jesus is. That's why it says that he's without father, without mother, without genealogy. Just means that he, he, they didn't know. He's a type of the Messiah who would come. It's called an archetype. An archetype is somebody who is, it, this is the first time tithing is mentioned in the scripture. And there's a rule, it's, it's called the rule first mention. When you read something in the scripture for the first time, there are all sorts of wonderful little hidden gems in there and you just have to dig them out. But he's an archetype of the Messiah and he's greater than Abraham because he blesses Abraham. Abraham doesn't bless him. And Abraham feels compelled then to respond and he gives him a tenth of everything that he has. And so he's blessing him. And with the bread and the wine, I mean, I, I see the picture of what Jesus did in the Last Supper and what we continue to do the first Sunday of every month, which is celebrate the sacrifice of the Lord for our sins. So this priesthood without dependency on descendancy. I made that up. <laughs> so it, it's not dependent on who he's related to. 
he was chosen by God to be this person, just like Jesus was. And that's the whole point. There are no term limits for Jesus, right? Now, if you were a priest, if you were an earthly priest, you'd be able to minister between 30 years and 50 years old. That's 20 years, and then you're done. They take you out. They put a younger man in your place. They do this in the world, don't they? Anyway, he's greater than Abraham, and he paid tithes to Melchizedek. So he's, he's this important figure, but he came out of nowhere, and he disappeared into thin air, seemingly. So what, what's this all about? Verse 5, and indeed, those who are the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. They're all descendants of Abraham. But he, whose genealogy is not derived from them, receives tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises, speaking of Melchizedek. Now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here, mortal man received tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak. For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So as you can see, this is a legal document. This is trying to go about a legal conversation about why Melchizedek is more important and more significant than the Levitical priesthood. He predates and he's greater because Abraham, who gives birth to Isaac, who gives birth to Jacob, who gives birth to Levi, he's a great, great, great grandfather. He paid tithes before Levi ever existed. So it, it's a whole comparison and a picture of who Jesus is. And basically the bottom line is Jesus is greater. Now remember, these Hebrews were thinking about going back to that sacrificial system. The writer is saying, why would you go back to something that's lesser? Because Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek, who predates the priesthood. Why would you leave Jesus to go back to an older system? That's like, why would you sell your new car for an old car? I mean, maybe you really like the old car. That's probably the reason. In verse 11, therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, and further, what further need was there of another priest that should rise according to the Melchizedek, and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there also is a change of law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, speaking of Jesus, who belongs to Judah, from which no man is officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. So he's saying Jesus, although he was from Judah, he ends up being our high priest because he's in the order of Melchizedek. He fulfills the prophecy that was found in 110, right? Psalm 110. So he is the fulfillment of that and is greater than the Levitical priesthood. And there's the, the passage to remind us. He is sworn and he will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, no one on this earth could be a priest forever because life prohibits them from continuing. They die or because of their age and they age out. And yet Jesus is eternal. And so he's a better priest because he doesn't have a term limit. I think term limits are good, don't you? Except for this. And it is yet far more evident in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing of a better hope through which we draw near to God. You understand when the law came, it was to prove to us that we needed a savior. Just take the top 10. She'll have no other gods before me. Oh, I guess I messed that up because there are things that I find more important sometimes than serving God. Let's take the last commandment. 
You shall not look at anything that's your neighbor and desire it. Just show me one commercial. I'm done. Oh, wow, the new iPhone's out. Did you see the new iPhone? See, now you just sinned against the Tenth Commandment. Because you desire things that are your neighbor's, which means you're not content with what you have, and you think that you know God's not taking care of you well enough. And so what happens is don't desire your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's ox or his donkey or anything that's your neighbor's. So don't look at their car or their iPhone or their clothing or their height or their weight or their status or how many friends they have on Facebook or... Don't look at all that stuff and desire to say, well, well how, come, how come nobody calls me? How come nobody? That's, that's what ends up happening, right? We compare ourselves to other people and then we feel like we don't have enough. Don't you? Yes. Okay, good. So I'm not the only one that does that. I just took the top commandment and the bottom commandment and, you know, you can go through them all. Thou shalt not steal. You ever take something? Shouldn't take? A pen at TD Bank, maybe? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, goodness. Somebody left something in my car. Oh, well. It's mine now. I go through the lost and found all the time. Right? Keep an eye on it. Just... I have nothing from the lost and found. Anyway. A better thing happened when Jesus came because he brought unconditional grace and forgiveness based upon what he did, not what we do. And that is salvation. It means we give our lives to him and say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exchange your life for mine. You can have my life, and I want yours. And that's what we get. It's the, it's the greatest deal you'll ever get in life. Jesus is greater in every respect than Moses, than the law. And we can draw near to God. You, you don't have to go to a priest. You don't have to go to a third party, an intermediary. You can go right to God. The scripture says in Hebrews 10, 22, we'll get there. Let us draw near with a true heart of full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You see, we can come before God and be forgiven of our sins and have our consciences cleansed, not just covered up. Like, okay, it's all right. I'll forgive you this time, but I got my eye on you. It's not like that. It's complete cleansing. And we don't bear it anymore. Jesus took it on the cross. And James 4, 8 says that we can draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Isn't that amazing? The impetus is on us to draw near to him. If, if you feel like, you know, you're not near God for some reason, guess who left? We draw near to God and he draws near to us. And that's a tremendous honor that he would stoop that low to have a relationship with his creation. And yet he does. And the promise is there that if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. And inasmuch as he was not made a priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, speaking of the Levitical priesthood, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety and a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Do you see the, the salesman who is writing the book of Hebrews is selling us on why Jesus is so much better than the old type and shadow that why would you consider leaving Jesus and a relationship with the creator of heaven and go back to some kind of a sacrificial system that is second rate at best, created by God <clears throat> for a time and for a reason, and yet now it is outdated. And that's the whole sense of the book of Hebrews. So Jesus was ordained by God, not by man. Although priests on, on, uh, you know, on firm earth here, we ordain people that are men. And it was with an oath from God. God made an oath. That's, that's a big deal when he says, you're going to be a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So there's a better commitment ceremony, if you will. It has an everlasting ministry because his ministry will never end. He imitates a, or he initiates a better covenant 
because it's not based on our performance. You know, you go standing before God on the day of judgment and he says, why should I let you into heaven? And most people say, well, because I, I did good stuff. Yeah, but I got a bigger list over here. What are you going to do with this? You know, and you can see the thing roll out and roll across the floor. You go, oh, I, I didn't think about that. The better covenant is Jesus rolls up the scroll and he just burns it. He says, welcome in. And it's not because of anything you did. It's because you asked God to be your God in your life. You asked and you believed in Jesus Christ and in his crucifixion, in his death, his resurrection, and you're buying it and you're going to follow him. That changes everything. He's always able to serve because he's eternal and he's got no term limit, which for him, I'm okay with. And so Jesus is better. It's a knockout punch. Jesus wins. Therefore, he is able to save those to the uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than all the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's for this. He did once for all when he offered up himself for the law appoints as high priests, men who have weakness, but the word of the oath, which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. So Jesus is a much better sacrifice he has a much better temple, which is his body, which is perfect. He was born out not in sin because he had no earthly father. So all of these things makes Jesus better. And the Old Testament is just a picture and a shadow of what Jesus fulfills. It's a better salvation. We have a better intermediary, one who can go to God on our behalf, who's Jesus, because he's perfect. And also he was tempted in every way as we are, and yet without sin. Now that's somebody you can trust, as opposed to talking to your psychologist. Because your psychologist is going to give you an opinion. Jesus is going to give you salvation. There's eternal intercession. He's always, just his very presence in heaven means you're secure. He is pure and holy, unlike human beings. He has more power. He's got higher authority. He's sacrificed for others. He himself was the sacrifice. He didn't just bring an animal and slit its throat and watch the blood drain from it as you put your hands over it. And that becomes a payment for your sin. Because I don't know about you, but I'd have to go daily and say, yeah, I messed up again. Here we go. I'm going to put down another perfect animal and it's all my fault. I'm glad I don't have to do that. But when I look at Jesus, I see that he was the perfect man and he was God incarnate in human flesh and that he sacrificed. His altar was better than ours. His altar was the cross and he chose to bear it. And he not only was the person who brought about the sacrifice, he was the sacrifice. And it says that God did this for you. He did this for me. Amen. When I look at that and I think about what Jesus did, I, how do you walk away from that and say, no, I got this. I can do it myself. I'll go back and I'll make sacrifices and I'll do good deeds. I'll walk old ladies across the street. You know, I'll fix stuff. I'll give money. I'll do. God doesn't want that. He wants your heart. And he doesn't want something cheap like just your words. What he wants is your life. <coughs> Those of us who have given our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ participate in a new nature, according to the scriptures. I can tell you there was a point at which I was an angry person all the time. And I just wanted to beat people up. I wanted to go and have fun. What I thought was fun. The next day you never think it's fun, but you think it's fun when you're going out try to drown my sorrows and forget about my troubles just to make more. 
And when the Lord came into my life and I said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. Come into my life because I believe that Jesus came for this, but you're going to have to show me. And I can tell you, he showed me. And now I'm not that same guy. That promise is for every one of us. It's for every one of us who puts our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, not in what you can supply and what you can give. And if you have not done that, it is the most important thing that you can do with your life. Say, God, I'm done. I'm undone. I completely understand who you are, that you sent Jesus to die for me. And I realize that I can't dig myself out of this hole. Because how do you dig yourself out of a hole? <laughs> You're just going to dig deeper. That's what it is to be saved. That's what it is to be a Christian. All other realms, all other religions, all other types of Christianity or types of whatever, it's a sham. They're trying to sell you something because it's a free gift that God offers for the asking. And he's the one who does the change. Amen? Amen. We just need to cooperate. But we can't cooperate in our sinful nature, can we? Because our sinful nature rages against the spirit, so we don't do what we would. I want to encourage every one of you, if you have not, if you have not initiated a conversation with the God of heaven, if you have not received the spirit of God into your body, if you have not had a dramatic and traumatic change in your life, because of that, it can happen right here, today, right now. And it's as easy as praying and asking the Lord to reveal himself and come into your life. If you want to do that, speak to me. If you want to do that, speak to one of our elders. If you're a young lady and don't feel comfortable talking to an old man like me, we got some wonderful women of God who would love to lead you in a prayer accepting the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as your savior so that you might have a relationship with the king of heaven at no cost. And you won't be joining a church. We're not trying to make a club. We're trying to have people get adopted into the family of God, which is a far bigger thing than just this one little place. As the worship team comes up, I want to pray. I want you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the clarity that we can have as we read it, that your spirit illumines our minds and moves in our heart. Lord Jesus, I pray for those that within the hearing of my voice who may not know you, They may not have ever had that experience of you coming into their life and taking away their sins and giving them new life. Lord, we pray for them that you would save them, that they might become your sons and your daughters, that you would adopt them, that you would reveal yourself to them. It's not by chance that they hear this message. And Lord Jesus, we know that you speak to our hearts. So we want to lift them before you and pray you save them. So today, Lord, we leave this with you. We pray that you help us. Help us to walk in that newness of life that you've called us to because we have a superior high priest. One who came and suffered and died in our place. So much more than just a lamb, the lamb of God. Help us, Lord, that our heart would be committed to you fully. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen.